We know that our Lord died on the cross for our sins and that we need to make a commitment to Him and, and sharing the gospel and living for Him. And we do that by obedience, unity in one of His churches. And we also do that by faithfulness. And when we fail, repent and get back to serving faithfully. But the Lord has not left us alone in His service. That's one reason why the Lord, I believe, established His churches, for we have a, a great helper that we call the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we ought, to, we ought to rely on Him. He is our strength and our guidance as we serve the Lord today. We had many songs this evening. It reminded me of that song, I'm Just a Pilgrim Wandering Through This Wearsome Land. We're on our way to heaven. We are heaven bound, but... Uh, we do have a job to do until the Lord calls us home. And that job is, is to serve Him and fulfill and work in that great commission. And the Holy Spirit is the one in this work who does the convicting. The Holy Spirit is the one in this work who reveals the truth. And my friends, I want you to know ultimately the job of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus. And He will help us with all those things. Our text tonight is John chapter 16, beginning with verse 7. And as you're turning there, I want to remind you of the great commission that is given to the Lord's churches. It's recorded, in my estimation, three times, no, five times, once in each gospel and once in the book of Exodus. And I'm eating too much. That's all I'm going to say. The oxygen level's low. So Exodus is the same as Acts. Uh, just keep up with me. I think most of you know. But, uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse uh, 18 through 20. I always like to include verse 18. Uh, the Lord gives us, if you will, I like to say the three categories of the Great Commission. Teach all nations and uh, lead them to the Lord, disciple them and baptize and and to, to learn and observe all things that Jesus has taught us. Over in the book of Mark, we have the Great Commission, and it, it tells us to preach the gospel to every creature, to everybody, good, bad, and ugly, and everybody in between. And then the book of Luke, chapter 24, verse 25, or 45 through 48, uh, the Lord tells us to be witnesses of Him and, and who He is. And so in particular, in our, in our job as a Great Commission, it's, it's about lifting up Jesus. And, and then in John chapter 20, verse 21 and 22, uh, the Lord says, as, as uh, the Father sent me, so I send you. So we're supposed to do this like Jesus did. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, uh, we find where we're supposed to do it. Everywhere. And so as we look at our job as a child of God, and if you've covenanted together with one of His churches, I hope all of you remember Brookside Baptist Church, except for me, I'm a member of Mount Calvary. But as you've covenanted together to fill out this great commission, uh, if you really look at it, it becomes a daunting task. And it is a daunting task to serve the Lord anyway, but my friends, the Lord has not left us helpless. He has given us a great help. Many people abuse the person of the Holy Spirit. But the Lord Jesus instructed His apostles the night he, before He was crucified on the work of the Holy Spirit. And I want us to see that here tonight, beginning in John chapter 16 and uh, verse 7. And I'll ask you to stand as we honor the reading of the Word of God, the book of John chapter 16 and verse 7. Jesus says here, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, is it expedient for you that I go away? For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have many things to say unto you, but, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, 
the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, and he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and, and shall show it unto you. A little while, and you see me no more, thou shalt not see me, and again, a little while, and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. Let's go to the Lord. Dear Lord, we come to you this evening, and we thank you, always thanking you diligently for our Savior, Jesus. Lord, I thank you that we have all eternity to thank you for Jesus. We've sung about heavenly places tonight and the, uh, the joys that we have in store for us. And I do thank you for such great hope and promise. And, and this hope and promise is not, not just uh, 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 something that could happen. No, Lord, by the power of Jesus, uh, this hope and promise will happen. And we thank you for such great promise that you've given to us. And now, Lord, I do pray that your Holy Spirit will help us Help us tonight to lift up His name and, and that uh, these people here at Brookside and, and those who are visiting will be encouraged and that they will uh, seek to serve you knowing that you are our strength. Just as you're the strength in salvation, you're the strength in service as well. And so, Lord, I do ask that you bless this message tonight. If one's here who has not trusted you as Savior, Lord, convict them that they might know that they have offended you, and they may also know that Jesus is the way of salvation. And Lord, we pray these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Amen. Well, now we do have a daunting task when we look at the Great Commission and serving the Lord. And many of you struggle individually in life and serving the Lord, maintaining your witness as we a little bit earlier and, and, and we do have those struggles and we have those struggles because of sin. We have those struggles because of not all, only other people's sin but our own sin in the flesh, don't we? Sometimes we're weak in the flesh and, uh, but the Lord gave us great help and great uh, uh, encouragement in, his, in the person of the Holy Spirit of God. And, and so when we look at this passage of Scripture, I want to remember the setting. Again, this is the night that Jesus is preparing his apostles. He's going to the cross of Calvary. He's going to be crucified the next day. And he says something interesting in verse 7. He says, uh, he, he said, it's, it, it's good for you that I go away. Uh, well, why? <laughs> well, he says, because the Holy Spirit is going to come. The Comforter is going to come. The Spirit of Truth is going to come. Now in my estimation, the reason why Jesus said this is because when he was here, now you do understand that Jesus, he's the head of the church. That means he's, he's the boss. He makes the rules and, and he leads and guides and directs. And we see what he was doing uh, when he began his church and his ministry. And, and this assembly followed him around and, and they learned of him and, and uh, did the things that he directed to do. But uh, and then Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23 and Colossians 1.18 tells us that he's the head of the church. That means he's the one that's in charge. Pastors really aren't in charge, you know. Deacons really aren't in charge. and uh, Any committees that a church might use aren't in charge. The Lord is in charge. Some years ago, Mount Calvary Baptist Church is right after 9-11. Uh, banking rules changed. And it became crazy. <laughs> and it just got worse, I think. Uh, but banking rules changed. They sent a paper... Uh, to Mount Calvary and, and uh, they said we need the signature of the owner of the church so they brought it to me and I said uh uh I will not sign that now as I went and looked at the IRS paperwork uh, our bank did not read the rest of it in fact the IRS got it correct and said this doesn't belong to churches uh, churches belong to the Lord Jesus he's the owner and we always need to remember that. But, but when the Lord was here, He was here bodily. And, and He limited Himself in, in that capacity. And then uh, 
after he died on the cross and rose again the third day, 40 days later, he ascended up into heaven on the right hand of God. And, and uh, there he's preparing a place for us. And Brother Poole would always say, hey, the Lord created the heavens and earth in six days and six nights. What's he preparing for us? He's been there 2,000 years. That's going to be something special. But here's something that uh, you remember about the Holy Spirit of God. He's not bound bodily. And I want you to know something. When you come together as a church, when Brookside comes together as a church, where two or three are gathered together in His name, and that passage of Scripture is in the church sense, the assembly sense, the Holy Spirit of God is with you. Whether you're with Him, I don't know, but he, He'll lead you if you let Him. And my friends, if Mount Calvary Baptist Church is meeting the same time that you do, guess what? The Holy Spirit of God is with us as well. Right. And, and, and this is why I believe the Lord said this thing in verse 7, it's good for me to go so that I can send you the Holy Spirit because this church started churches and those churches started churches and churches start churches and, and, uh, and of course with a good lineage back to Jesus who it's His church. He's the owner of and he's the head. And so he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the Holy Spirit. And I want us to see the work of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know somebody? And you can lift up your hands and your heart. You don't have to lift them up physically. How many of you know somebody that needs to be saved? And maybe you've worked on them and worked on them. And you just, you just want to be saved for them. You love them so much. Anybody got kids? When my kids were born, that's the first thing I was, I was praying for that before they were born. But I'll tell you something, I cannot be saved for my children, no matter how much I want. But the Bible tells us here that the Holy Spirit of God, when He comes, He's, he, he's going to do three things. There's three aspects of His work. And it falls under this category, this, this one particular word. It says here in verse 8, and when he has come, he will reprove the world. That's what the Holy Spirit's going to do. And uh, that word, we could, we could say convict. He's going to convict people. He's going to reprove people of these three things. Number one, sin. Number two, righteousness. Number three, judgment. He's going to convict people of sin. And uh, what is sin? Sin is breaking the law of God. Uh, we can go to the Ten Commandments and look at those laws. And, and, and some of those laws are uh, broken. We, we bro if you're honest, you've broken them all. But one of those that really is my pet peeve, and since I don't preach to y'all all the time, I, I mentioned it already once, but using the Lord's name in vain. Well, uh, people, people just don't care to use His name as a sign of disgust. And now, fellas, how do you like it when your wife uses your name in vain? Lord doesn't either. <laughs> hey, that's not respectful. And so that's just one of those laws. Another one, honor your mother and your father. And, and sometimes that's difficult. I remember my dad, he, he'd been on a ventilator for a week. And, and uh, I went in there and I was taking care of my daddy. You know, that's strange for me to take care of my daddy. And the doctor said, well, you might get to go home today. And the doctor went out and I turned around. Daddy was ripping everything off. And I said, Daddy, put it back on. He said, I'm the daddy. <laughs> I said, well, Lord, how do I honor my daddy now? <laughs> he's telling me to leave him alone, but if he takes that stuff off, he's going to hurt. And so sometimes we struggle with how to do those things. But you know, honor your mother and your father. And, and, and uh, the Lord said, uh, uh, um, if you have hatred towards one another, uh, that's the same as murder. To look upon a woman in lust is the same as adultery. And, and so we can see those crimes against God and, and the Holy Spirit will convict people uh, what is wrong and that we have sinned against God. And my friend, unless uh, you realize your sin against God, how will you come to Him for salvation? And so the Lord comes to convict. Also to convict of righteousness. Because Jesus is gone. And there's a few things I could say here, but I just I just want to leave it to one aspect. The Holy Spirit of God convicts us of what
what is the right thing to do. Jesus is the standard of what is righteousness. And if we want to know what the right thing to do is, we can study the life of Jesus. He fulfilled everything the Father asked him to do. And uh, not too long ago, just a, an illustration of the right thing to do, but yet leaving it undone, it becomes sin. Is a couple Sundays ago, maybe a month ago, my son's vehicle had been acting up and I said, you, you bring it home, you take mine and we'll work on it. The Lord blessed me and showed me what it was and I can tell you that story and tell some of you that story already. But I was walking out of church Sunday and Dale, um, one, one of our fellows there, he's a police officer. And we were last to leave and he said, Brother John, tell me it ain't so. It ain't so. He looked down at my son's license plate. He said, that expired in October, Brother John. It's a good thing I'm not on duty. Because that's an $80 ticket. <laughs> and the next morning, it was a ticket. It had its tag on it. I went and got that taken care of. And it was the right thing to do to go and get my car license. And sometimes when we don't do the right thing, we, uh, we're doing the wrong thing. And so that's one aspect of the Lord uh, uh, convicting us of, of righteousness. But I'll just say this one more thing. You know, uh, Jesus will say, I'm going to say it for the next point. <laughs> and then the third thing, it says, uh, the Holy Spirit will convict of judgment. Because this world is judged. He, he, he will convict that there is a judgment price for sin uh, that we've committed against God and that one day we will stand before the Almighty Judge, the Creator of heaven and earth. And Do you know the reason why many people don't want there to be a Creator? It's because they don't want there to be a Judge. Right. Peter will say a little bit later in his book, he'll say, uh, folks will deny the flood. Why will they deny the flood? Because that means that God was angry with sin and judged the whole world. And that means He's going to do it again. And the Holy Spirit will convict people that there is a, a time to answer. One of my uh, favorite uh, scientists to study after and, and think about and just my mind falls out of my head when I do is, is uh, Einstein, the theory of relativity. And, and I'm told, I never did meet him personally, <laughs> that he declared because of his theory that there must be a God. But he refused to believe in a personal God. I'm going to tell you why. Because he didn't want to answer to me. But the Holy Spirit of God will convict people. He'll let people know and in their vain imagination they will reject such conviction. And so I ask the question, what does it mean to be convicted? Well, just think of our courtrooms today. When somebody goes to court, and the judge says, you're guilty, then you are convicted. Some people believe that when the Holy Spirit convicts you, that you will, you will be emotional. I believe that if the Holy Spirit convicts you, and you understand you're convicted, it can surely cause emotions. But, but emotionality and spirituality are two different things. Spirituality can cause emotions. But emotion, and just because you're crying doesn't mean you're spiritual. Right. By the way, no, I won't pick on that. <laughs> but growing up, uh, I said I wouldn't, now I am. Growing up, uh, uh, I, there's some fellas that would say amen pretty loud, and then they'd go out and live oh me. And I'd rather have something that would, somebody who'd say oh me, and go out and live amen. The Holy Spirit of God will do this work. He'll, he'll bring conviction. And if, and if you know that you have sinned against God, you are therefore convicted. You're convicted. I want you to know that I'm not really a sympathetic person. I, when somebody's hurting, I, I don't really I don't have those sympathies until I start to sit down and think, okay, this is what that person is going through. This is the, and I try to think about the pain that I would be going through. And when I think it through, then I become sympathetic. Then I become emotional sometimes. And then, uh, then my heart bleeds for people and the things that they're going through when I think it through. 
And so it is with conviction. When you begin to think it through and say, Oh me, I am a sinner against God. Oh me, my righteousness. There's none righteous, no, not one. Oh me, I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to be condemned for all eternity. Then you surely might get emotional about it. I love the testimony of Tyler Dixon when he got saved. They, they said he, uh, church camp, said he walked forward and talked to Brother Keith Wilson and was doing a dance. He was ready to get saved. He was excited. And it can be an emotional experience, but the convicting power of the Holy Spirit can cause emotion, but it's not necessarily emotional. But, but we also see the three reasons why the Holy Spirit will do this work. It says here that the Holy Spirit will convict people of sin because they believe not on me. Why is the Holy Spirit going to convict people? Because people need to be saved. That's just what that is. The second portion here, he says, is going to convict people uh, of righteousness. And Jesus says, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. You see, the Holy Spirit's going to uh, let us know about Jesus. And Jesus being the standard, he's in heaven uh, now. And how many of you have seen Jesus with a physical eye? No one. But how many of you have seen Jesus with the eyes of faith? Amen. You see, that's, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He, he, he shows us the righteousness of Jesus and, and his purity and his holiness and how uh, everything the Father asked him to do. And, and when we see the righteousness of Jesus, we see two things. First off, we see that we don't measure up because we haven't done everything right, have we? And the Bible says the Lord's going to judge the world in righteousness. And I'll say it this way to see if you did everything right. But then also we see that Jesus did everything right and he did it even to the cross of Calvary. And by his righteousness, we can be saved. And the Holy Spirit of God does that convicting. And he also convicts of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Now when I think about the prince of this world, that being Satan, I think about what Jesus had to say in Matthew chapter 25 verse 11. Now the judgment of nations, and says the Lord, those in short who have rejected Jesus during that tribulation period, he says, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Sometimes I say that if you die without Jesus as your Savior, you're going to spend eternity in a devil's hell. Now by that, I do not mean that Satan owns hell. He does not own hell. It is not his. He is not in charge of it either. Right. But it was prepared for him and that's where he's going. And if you'll remember a little bit earlier in this week, I said if you don't choose Jesus, then you have chosen to reject Jesus. Right. So guess where you're going to spend eternity? In a devil's hell. It's going to be your hell. Because that's where you're going. It's because you've rejected Jesus. And my friends, I want you to know that the convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God is great and awesome. And He convicts people of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And without the message of sin, how shall you look for righteousness? And how shall you see Jesus? And how shall you know that you need forgiveness and eternal life? And so then we look at the work of the Holy Spirit in these three categories, if you will, then we think that we're supposed to go out into the whole world and, and teach people about salvation and convince them to follow the Lord through baptism and to learn all things, apply those things to your life and, and, uh, and to reach everybody in the world and to, uh, and to do it like Jesus did it and to, and to reach every place in the world as well. How shall we do it? And listen, you just do what the Holy Spirit wants you to do because it's really the Holy Spirit's job to get it done. Right. It's His job. It's our job to be obedient. I think I said a little bit earlier this week, it's not your job to be effective for God. It's His job to be effective. It's your job to be obedient to what He called you to do. You can't win anybody to the Lord. You can tell them about Jesus 
But it's the Holy Spirit who's going to convict them. It's the blood of Jesus that's going to sing. But for some reason, by the grace of God, Brother Edmonds, He's chosen to use us to be His vessels. To carry out this great work, and especially in His churches. And so, then we get to verse 13. Well, how do we tap into that Holy Spirit of God? You don't do it by any breathing exercises. <laughs> you don't do it by any, any, any pattern like that, but you do it by the truth. And notice this in verse, verse 13. I entitled this section, The More Work of the Holy Spirit. And here's what Jesus says, How be it when the Spirit of truth is come, He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatever she, he shall hear, uh, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to go, come. How be it relates this verse back to what has already been said. And, uh, and so I, I want to do the who, what, where, when, and why in this portion. Well, who is the Lord speaking to? He's speaking to the apostles. Now, how does this apply to us today? I want to remind you in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, the Bible says the Lord put first in, in the church the apostles. So it, it's a church office. The apostolic office, is, it, it's not used today, but it was, it was a church office. So when the Lord was talking to these apostles, it's a message for us that we can learn from as well. He says, and so my second question then is, well, what is he talking about when he's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit? That's easy enough. Now, here's another question. When is he talking? He's talking before the New Testament is written. Do you know the Holy Spirit of God would, would move these apostles and, and those who, who followed after them like uh, Luke and Mark and then he would also use the Apostle Paul as well. And he would, he would uh, by his Holy Spirit, he would inspire these men of God to, uh, to bring together the, the New Testament. Right. And this New Testament, by the way, fits with the Old Testament. Yes. Without the Old Testament, the New Testament has no foundation. Right. Without the New Testament, the Old Testament has no conclusion. <laughs> And so, uh, he, 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 this is given before the New Testament. In fact, he says, there's some things, fellas, you're not ready for just yet. <laughs> and I remind you, Paul says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all die. And I think that message comes a little bit later. But he says, there's, there's some, some things coming. Now, where, where is he talking and what culture is he talking in? What situation is he talking in? Jesus is the master teacher. And these fellas, now they're holding the office of apostle, but they're disciples. Do you know what disciples should be? They should be learners of and followers of. He's telling these fellas, hey, you're going to follow me. I'm going to go away, and you're going to still follow me. And you're not going to be alone with this because I'm sending the Holy Spirit so that you can continue to follow me. And why is he telling them this? Well, because in the Great Commission recorded in the book of Matthew, he ends it with this, Lord, I'm with you always. Jesus will not leave us alone in his service. Amen. He's called us to serve. And you know, a church is made up of individuals. You understand that? Individuals who have come together. And, and when you depart from this assembly tonight, you're going to have to serve the Lord as an individual out there in the world. Representing the Lord, representing this church. How are you going to do that? You don't have the strength to do it, but the Holy Spirit does. You just do what the Holy Spirit asks you to do and let Him take care of the rest. And so then, we find the overall work of, of the Holy Spirit. He says, He shall glorify me, for He shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore said I that He shall take of mine and shall show it She'll show it unto you. So what is the overall work of the Holy Spirit? He's going to show us everything we need to know about Jesus. I'm going to tell you where you find everything you need to know about Jesus. 
Who wrote this? Over 40 different men inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. It's a Holy Spirit writing using, using vessels. You have everything you need to know about Jesus here. And you know what Jesus said in the, in the book of John when talking to Philip? I think in uh, John chapter 14, he said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Everything we need to know about God today, we have right here. Everything we need to know about, if you will, the plan of salvation, or let me say it this way, because the Holy Spirit lifts, lifts up Jesus, everything we need to know about the man of salvation. Everything we need to know about the head of the church whom we should follow and serve in baptism and observing all things, including, including baptism, the Lord's Supper, and being uh, husbands and wives like we ought to every aspect of life, it's recorded right here. And so when we go to fulfill this great commission, every place we go and encouraging people to go, we need to go by the power of the Holy Spirit and ultimately it's by lifting up the Word of God. Amen. My friends, if you want people to be saved, you will spiritually throw down the Word of God, stand upon it, and proclaim, thus saith the Word of God. We are all sinners. Come short of the glory of God, but the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. When it comes to serving the Lord, you can stand upon the authority of the Word of God. So, you know, the Bible defines a, a church like this, the ecclesia, local visible assembly. The Bible tells us we're to observe like this. The Bible tells us that we're to be husbands like this, and wives like this, and children like this. We can live our life by this authority. And when I mean this authority, I mean the Word of God. Amen. When you live by the Word of God, you truly have life. For what did Jesus say in John chapter 14? He says, I'm the way. Remember the way we talked about earlier? That's a way of salvation. But he says, I'm the truth. And he says, I'm the life. And my friends, when you hear the gospel message and you humble yourself and you realize, hey, I've sinned against God, consider yourself convicted. You go to Jesus and call out to him, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then you know the way of living. And you continue to live for the Lord. You don't just live for the Lord when you're born again. You live for the Lord beginning when you're born again. And so I ask you these questions. Have you yielded to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God and salvation? And if you have, trust in Jesus. Have you yielded to the power of God and surrendered your life to Him and, and said, I'm going to take your word even if I don't understand why it's that way, I understand that you are the truth. And I'm going to live upon it and proclaim it. What decision will you make tonight as our musicians come and as our pastor comes? Have you yielded to the Holy Spirit of God in salvation? Have you yielded to the Holy Spirit of God to lift up the name of Jesus? To be the tool of God in proclaiming the glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You're not alone. He's here to help you. And he's here to be trusted, not only in salvation, but also.